Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. It's a blessing for us to be here, man. Amen. We want to say a special welcome to Mardi and Deborah after their long trip. Good to be back. It's good to be back, amen. Yes. There's no place like home. Welcome to those of us who are here. God has been good to us. And uh, it's a blessing to just meet together and praise God and to receive a blessing Amen. from Him. Amen. In this day and age of uncertainty, uh, uneasiness, contention and strife all around us, we need to hear a word from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Yes. Because when Christ came, the first time he came, at the appointed time. When Jesus comes the second time, he's coming back with catastrophic suddenness. Amen. As a thief in the night, ready or not, here I come. Amen. We gotta get ready and stay ready for that great event. What a day that will be. But just before the coming of Jesus the second time, the world will be in chaos, in confusion. And the people of God will need a faith that we do not now possess. Amen. Faith that will endure. We got to determine that where I stand, the link will not break. Mm. That we will not bend or bow. That we will be true as the needless to the poor. Amen. We will stand up and be counted. And the psalmist David reminds us, has given us a psalm. Psalm 91, he says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise of pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shall thou trust. Amen. Amen. His truth shall be thy shield and buckle. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flight by day. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, Amen. nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand. But it shall not come nigh thee, only with the eye shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. And then he says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. Amen. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. And these are passages that will strengthen us along this life's journey. Amen? Yes. You know, Jesus said that straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. The word there for straight is not S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, -T, but it's S-T-R-A-I-T. -T. It means austere. It means hard. It means difficult. Difficult is a way to eternal life. It is not a bed of roses. It says narrow is a way. Straight and narrow, hard and difficult. And few there be that find it. Amen? But he gives us the strength. To endure, amen. amen. David said, A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never fail. We serve a mighty God, amen. amen. In case you're wondering where I get the sermon title from, 
the story is told of a young seminarian who had to turn in his final papers for his grade. And so he did, and the professor, after looking at his paper, gave him an F for his final grade. And um, he was drawn back and he went to his professor and he said, how come? And the professor said to him, well, you have a good introduction, great uh, body, good substance, tremendous appeal, but something about your sermon title. He said, uh, nobody's coming to listen to a sermon that is entitled The Periscope of Jesus in the Eschatology of the Apostle Paul. And he said, but if you can come up with a better sermon title, one that is captivating, one that is amazing, one that is alluring, one that gets people's attention, one that if a busload of people should pull up and they should see the sermon title on the billboard, they should be willing to run out of the bus into the church. And so he went home and sweating bullets. And he did get an A for his uh, a class. assignment, and he came up with a new sermon title. His title was, your boss has a bomb on it. <laughs> and I'm here to suggest to us, not only the boss has a bomb, but this world has a bomb on it. Yes. There is a time bomb that's about to go off. And uh, we as God people, we are, we are responsible to some extent, because we were introduced to the truth, amen? amen? And that gives us an awesome responsibility to let the world know that this world is about to go up in flames. And they got to prepare to meet the Creator, the God of the universe, amen? amen. And on that day, there will only be two groups of worshippers. One group will be running to the rocks and mountains and saying to the rocks and mountains that they'll be worshipping, saying to the rocks and mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne. And another group will be saying, Lord, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Every individual will be either one or the other. I hope and pray that will be in the camp of Jesus. Amen? Amen. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, as we come before the throne of grace, nothing in our hands we bring, but simply to the cross of Christ we claim. Lord, I realize that you don't need me. You never needed me. But right now I need you. I ask, O oh Lord, that you will take me just like a sorry old rusty nail and let that nail be hammered into the wall and then, then take the portrait of a, of, a, of a splendid Christ and hang it on that nail. Let Christ be seen and heard and known. Speak to me, through me and for me. And we pray that all of us will learn something that will draw us closer to you. Let your name be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are not that important. Amen. Amen. What you and I say is not edged out in concrete. We need the Lord. If there is ever a time that we need Him, we need Him now. Amen. I turn your attention to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. Reading from verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now it's not a word of a friend. It's not a word of the mayor. It's not the word of some counselor or some president of some great nation. It's not the word of a king. It's the word of the Lord. And sometimes I wonder 
that we don't really appreciate and understand. It's a privilege for someone to hear the word of the Lord. It is a word that moved and said, let there be light. And there was light. Psalm 119 and verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Amen. It's the word of the Lord that came to Jonah. In verse 9 it says, Where at all shall a young man cleanse his way, but by taking heed according to the word. Psalm 119 and verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. John 14 says in, in verse 1, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14 says, And the word became flesh. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. What a privilege it is for one to hear the word of the Lord. And, and the word today is shying away from the word of the Lord. And we are being controlled either by God or by the devil. Amen. We in ourselves are never in charge. We are never in control of our lives. We are being influenced either by God or by the devil. Amen. And it's a blessing, it's a privilege to hear the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise. See, whenever the word of the Lord comes to an individual, it's always to arise, to get up. This church is a movement. Amen. And it's bound for glory, amen? amen? It's always a call to arise, to get up, to wake up to the realization of the times in which we are living in. The word of the Lord came, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. Now the young prophet Jonah heard the clear, distinct word of God, Arise, go to that great city. Now in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 11 it says, that the city had an inhabitant of uh, 120,000 individuals. It was not a large city according to the circumference, it was about uh, 27 miles in circumference, but when God called Nineveh a great city, one writer said it was great in wickedness, great in sin. The, the people of Nineveh, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, and it was a city that was great in wickedness. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah and saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. Because God was, God's anger was kindled against their wickedness, that great Assyrian city. And God was telling Jonah, Go tell them, I know all about their sin, their wickedness, their lifestyle, and I can take it no longer. Now Jonah was not excited about this mission. You see, Jonah, like every good Jew, he hated Nineveh and he hated the people who lived in Nineveh. See, because the people of Nineveh were the enemies. Nineveh is located on the east side of the Tigris River in land today that we call Iraq. It was the capital of Assyria. And God in his mercy wanted Jonah to know that he loved the people of Nineveh just as he loved the Jews. I want us to understand that God does not love one race of people more than he loved the other. Amen. Amen. At the foot of the cross, there is level ground. Yes, Every individual is a candidate for the kingdom. Hallelujah. Because the people of Nineveh, because of their luxurious living, their immorality, their lies, their drunkenness, 
there was a blood in the city. They were godless heathens, they were ruthless barbarians. Now, historians tell us that uh, amongst the cruel methods of torture, uh, one method was they would take their prisoner, the victim out into the hot sand, and they would bury him or her up to the neck, and then they would inflict a wound in the tongue or in the head, and then they would allow the insects and the other creatures to come and feed on that individual until he loses his life. It was a gruesome way to die. The usual practice was these, uh, the people of Nineveh went after the capture of a city, they would mutilate all the male prisoners. Some they would cut off their heads, some they would cut off, cut off their hands, their legs, they would put on their eyes and they would pile up a great heap. And they would allow them to die from the sun, from the heat, from flies, from insects. They were ruthless barbarians. They would cut off their tongues and uh, add an insult to injury. They would, they would kill all uh, the children, all the women. And the king would be taken off to Nineveh and then he would be beaten and then he would be both alive for the king's amusement. Entire cities would commit suicide rather than fall into the hands of the wicked Assyrians of Nineveh. Now some of us did not know that background. Now you can well understand when God said to Jonah, go, Jonah said no. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Because maybe the, uh, the, the Syrians had attacked the, the city of the Jews many times. And maybe Jonah himself had suffered the loss of loved ones at the hands of these wicked Assyrians. And as every good Jew, as every loyal, patriotic Jew, they were told to love uh, the neighbor and hate the enemy. And in the mind of Jonah, Nineveh was the enemy. Amen? Mm -hmm. The Assyrians were so feared that they were hated that Jonah had nothing to do with the people of Nineveh. But I, I'm here to remind us, friend of mine, that God is a loving God. Amen? Amen. Yes. Jonah had a visceral, he had a hatred for the Assyrians. When God saw Nineveh, he saw the people that he loved as much as he loved the Jews. Jonah could care less about the people of Nineveh. In his mind, he didn't want God to show mercy on them. Now God decided to use Jonah for this tremendous mission. How would you like to be standing in, the, in Jonah's shoes? And God told you, and you hear this clear word from God, that Jonah decided to, to flee in the opposite direction. He wanted nothing to do with the people of Nineveh. The Bible tells us, in verse 2, but Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, now, now God said that heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. If you, made your, if you make your bed in hell, he is there. Is there any way we can hide from the Lord? There is no way we can hide from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now, there are some individuals who have turn their backs on the Lord and, and, and don't give up on them. I remember a Judas who turned his back on the Lord after Jesus prayed for him and gave him many chances. But, jo but, 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 but Judas, when he walked away, 
that night on the Passover supper and he walked out into the darkness, he had went beyond his day of grace. That was the last call. Herod the Great, when he beheaded John the Baptist, he had seen his day of grace and when Jesus was taken to Herod's palace, Jesus had nothing to say to Herod. There are individuals who have turned their backs and God gave up, gave up on them. God did not give up on Jonah because God looked down and saw maybe if he had a second chance, maybe he, I can curb the situation, amen? Now God is a God of second chances. Amen. All of us have been given second and third and fourth and fifth chances by the Almighty God, amen? amen. Adam had one strike against it. God said to him, in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. Mm -hmm. Amen? Now, God does not play with words, amen? He means exactly what he says. When he says do, he means do, amen? When he says don't, he means don't. God means exactly what he says, and God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But we continue in sin because God's judgment is not executed speedily, but God is the same. Amen. He does not change. Amen? Amen? He means exactly what he says. We thank God for his patience, for his grace, for his mercy. Now, according to the scripture reading, Jesus calls us to love our enemies. Now, I decided to bring this message because in this day and age, make no mistake about it, the time is coming and some of us, we got to rethink our thoughts right now. Amen. Because most of us don't understand what it is to love our enemies. And some of us don't even care to understand what it means to love our enemies. Very flippantly, we mentioned where Jesus says love your enemies, but what it takes to love our enemies is outside of our human nature. It goes against our grace. Amen? Yes. Loving our enemies is something we don't really understand and we ought to have very little to do with. Now let's look at the scriptures and see, according to the biblical definition, who is our enemy? An enemy, according to Jesus, is someone who hates you. Amen? Imagine the conflicting emo emotions in our mind when Jesus calls upon us to love our enemies. Loving our enemies is a tremendous, tremendous, difficult thing that Jesus asks of us. We cannot do it in our own strength. Amen. Only by the grace and the mercy of God. As a matter of fact, we have enough trouble loving our friends yes. and family members and relatives and loved ones. We have enough trouble getting along with our own that think like-minded. It's difficult to get along with people whom we know and whom we love. Now, loving your enemies is a holy volume. And when our rights and our privileges and our freedom is going to be taken away from us, and yet the command is, because the word of God does not change, because in chapter 2, when the word of the Lord came again to Jonah, the word of God did not change, it was the same word. Yes. Amen? Yes. God does not change when he says, love your enemies. Now, we want to consider 
an enemy. Now, I came across this story 10 years after World War II. I believe I said this some time ago. Some Germans, some West German Christians, met some Christians in Warsaw, Poland. And they wanted to know if they could meet and uh, kind of mend the situation of the atrocities that was committed by the German army during World War II. When the idea was presented, uh, some of the Christians in Warsaw, Poland, they didn't even want to consider such an idea. Uh, the meeting was scheduled and they, they met together. And you could imagine the, after 10 years, Christians on either side, uh, the Christians in Warsaw, Poland said to the Christians in Germany, the wounds are still too fresh. Every stone in Warsaw, Poland is stained with, with Polish blood from a German bullet obeying it. And the one who was most adamant in his opposition, and he said, it's, it's, this is difficult. And they decided to part ways and dismiss the, the meeting. But one of the German Christians said, can we say the Lord's Prayer before we leave? And they began by saying the Lord's Prayer, but when they reached the part that says, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, no one would co could continue, there was silence. And uh, the Polish Christian, the one who was most adamant in his oppo opposition, said, if I cannot begin to forgive, I cannot pray this prayer. This is difficult, friend of mine. We can remember some of the things that have happened to us in our life journey. And some things are difficult even today, whether the individual is, lives near or far. We still have it in our hands. If we see that individual walk through those doors today, can we in temper and in tone love them and be loving to them? Because it's fresh in our minds what we have gone through, amen? And yet Jesus calls upon us to love our enemies. Loving our enemies is difficult. Now, before we get to Hal and Jonah, we need to think about ourselves. Amen? We love to read the stories. And we love to say, well, why did not Jonah listen the first time? Why? Now, he could have avoided a lot of the headache and heartache. As a matter of fact, when God calls us the first time, it's always easiest. Amen? Amen? Wow. You know, if Jonah had gone to Nineveh the first time, he could have stayed in some hotel on his way to Nineveh. He could have had fresh meals. Amen. He could have breakfast, lunch, and dinner on his way to Nineveh. Amen. When God calls us, <laughs> it is true. Amen. When God calls us the first time, it's always the easiest time. It's the best time to listen. When God calls us the second time, it's always more difficult. Yes. Amen? Yes. As a matter of fact, Paul says, after a life of repeated sins, our conscience is burned, our heart is hardened, and we cannot hear the voice of God. We cannot appeal to the, to the wooing of the Holy Spirit. And why says, after a life of repeated sins, if we come to God, it is by a miracle. There is no guarantee that we can come to Jesus. Amen? Because of a life of repeated sins. What was once wrong seems right. There is no guarantee that we come to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Because there are two masters. Amen? It is better to listen to the voice of God, to the word of the Lord, the very first time. Amen, brother. Preach it. 
And you know, the, I could imagine the groanings of the hearts of parents about their strange children. Remember when Johnny was in college, he never missed church. He would go to church in, in, in Daytona every Sabbath morning, every Friday. We had called